or witnessed it. Um, they see it as a problem, et cetera. So thank you for, um, for the work your organization is doing. Um, I now uh, want to recognize Ranking Member Boss for five minutes. Ranking Member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my, my first question, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Prenzler, first off, uh, Semper Fi, uh, but I'm going to uh, ask because it was mentioned in my opening, you know, what impact does the term broken veteran and the narrative in some of our communities do for our veterans' economic prospects and as well as their mental health when, when they hear that our vote, our veterans are broken? Um, thank you for the question. I, I uh, have rarely encountered that in uh, my time outside of the Marine Corps. I left in 2015. Uh, I don't deny that it exists in some corners. I know it's been a trope in some Hollywood movies that we've seen. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it has had a contributing factor to preventing veterans from seeking mental health care. But, you know, I, I'm also very concerned about uh, the reputation of veterans, especially in the light of what took place on January 6th. I mean, you know, in, in our military as well, since um, November 2018, the Reagan Foundation found that public trust in the military has slipped by 14 percentage points to today. And also uh, the Veterans and Citizens Initiative did a poll and last November uh, until March of this year, we also found public trust in veterans as good role models slip by a similar percentage point of 14 points. So ranking member, my, my concern is that as long as we maintain an all volunteer force, uh, the, the public perception of our veterans and our military remains critical because we know that veterans reputations and our recommendations to young people to consider the military as an occupation is almost the number one or number two factor that recruiters will list as why they join the force. So, you know, while that the narrative that you brought up is is uh, problematic, um, I'm very concerned about this issue and about the public perception of our veterans as you are. As I am, yes. Right, Mr. Butler, you know, what do, what role does a successful transition to civilian life have for like a, a newly separated veteran to avoid temptations to join these groups and promote violent and, and, and promote violent extremism? Yeah, thank you, sir. I, I think that's a huge part of not just this issue, but so many others that veteran service organizations uh, are, are working on right now. The better that we can, better job that we can do in supporting our veterans when they transition, I think we're really going to get ahead of many issues, not just uh, extremism, but certainly uh, underemployment, unemployment, educational benefits. You know, so much of what uh, VSOs do, and certainly what IAVAC is when members reach out to us for support, is that. If they had come to us sooner, you know, we would have cut off a crisis and really just been able to help them uh, with the transition and with some changes. So I think the more that we can do to connect, uh, maybe not with just with veterans, but with active duty service members who are looking forward to when they transition into the veteran community, how we can start helping them earlier. Uh, we're going to tackle, I think, a lot of these problems. And I think a lot of them are related. I think if you talk about underemployment, unemployment, lack of a sense of purpose in a, within a veteran, you're talking about the same issues that are also leading towards them being uh, exploited by extremist groups. So, so, and then what, just a real quick follow-up, because then I want to get to another question here. Um, but what do you think we should add to the TAP program to, to train these veterans and, and be, have them be aware? Yeah, I think a lot of it can be just a greater uh, exposure to what some of these veteran service organizations are doing that can help them with the transition, especially the post 9-11 groups that are so focused on uh, continuing your service uh, as a civilian. Okay, this is for the whole panel, and I really do want to get to this. You know, this is from whomever, for whoever wants to answer. Um, the groups that have all discussed today all share some level of uh, anti-government beliefs. The, the RAND Corporation found a heavy-handed attempts to for institutions can increase that can increase radicalization. So what policies should government implement to address violent anti-government groups without further inflaming their already uh, sentiment uh, and increasing their message instead of, you know, basically fanning the flames? Anyone? I can uh, I, I can jump in on that. Thank you um, for the question. I mean, I think this is a it's a it's a it's also the same problem that we face with conspiracy theories, which is attempts to uh, address them can cause people to dig in their heels even more. It's one of the reasons why I think um, preemptive education, which teaches everybody about the manipulative tactics of groups and narratives that are out there, is one strategy that government can invest in. Uh, kind of digital and media literacy for everybody, whether we're talking about veterans or fifth graders or fifty year olds. 
um, that is something that that is not um, targeting the ideology itself, but the tactics and the manipulative strategies used by those extremist groups to try to exploit people. I just think that's something that that you know we should be very aware of. We want to help. We don't want to make it worse. Um, and and when you get to the with many people who get involved with these groups, that's easy to stir. I'm afraid. So with that, my time uh, uh, ran out, and Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Uh, thank you for your very thoughtful questions, Ranking Member. Um, I uh, now call on uh, 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 